Tina Leonard was the first female magician I ever saw. Her Mr. Mopman act made a lasting impression and inspired me to create magic that has meaning and tells a story. Mr. Mopman and Tina have starred on stage and screen all over the world for over 30 years. Mr. Mopman is just one facet of Tina's remarkable performance repertoire and skill set, but it's the one that made a lifetime impression on me and many in the entertainment and magic communities. It's my pleasure to talk to Tina today and to share some of her experiences, her impressions, her knowledge of performance, music, mime, and magic with a twist and breath of yoga on the side. Please join me in welcoming Tina Leonard. Thanks so much for asking me. Can you just sort of break down for viewers that aren't familiar with you a little bit about your history, uh, you know, and, and your involvement in magic? Yeah, sure. Um, I, think, you know, I was thinking about this before we started talking about how things go back to, to when we're three years old, if I went back that far, because it's that, it took all that and all the different decisions that were made, not just by me, but all the people around me to, to take me where I am. I don't, I don't think that as artists, or we we don't choose it's not a choice it seems to be something that grabs us and won't let go and that's such a beautiful thing so it's like probably 22 of 22 when i got hit with the mind bug i decided i had to be a mime there's a whole history of that where i saw this amazing mime his name is robert shields he was yes. a street performer and i saw him and my whole world turned upside down i mean i was a guitar major in college a classical guitar major at the time and that hit me and that's when i learned I learned a few times throughout my life, if something grabs you that hard, you listen mm -hmm. and you follow up as long as it's not illegal and as long <laughs> as it's not going to hurt anybody else. Yes. You know, I do consider that, but I'm a real fan of, of listening to those things, that little worm that takes a hold of you and says, I'm not going to let go. So a friend of mine who was a street magician um, invited me to the Magic Castle and I lived near there. So I knew the building and I love old buildings. So I thought, oh, it's my good opportunity to see this whole building and from the inside. And I walked in and I went, oh my God, this is it. I, I have to be here. And I um, so I called the Magic Castle the next day and I said, uh, it was actually Bill Larson that I talked to, how far back it was and how small it was. Mm -hmm. And Bill was a really nice man. And he said, well, you know, you have to be a magician if you want to work at the Magic Castle. And I said, oh, um, how do I solve that problem? <laughs> And I met a few really nice magicians and started hanging out there and whenever I could, I could get there. And I came to the understanding that the two, that magic and mime are related, especially the way I wanted to look at it, that it was, for me, it was a way to extend my magic act. And I had a magic act where I was like a little wind up doll. So uh, I somehow put it together that those two work together. They're all about illusion. Subscribe now and click on the bell to receive weekly notifications of new content. How did Mr. Mopman evolve? Uh, doing the doll act, I was getting into my 20s, early into my 30s, probably 34, 35. And over the years, I'm thinking, this is what I do. This is all I know how to do now because I do it all the time. And it's been good for me, the, both the doll, the, the character, doll character and the act. But am I still going to be doing this when I'm 40 or 50? And no, I can't. What am I going to do? So this ground, this ground on me for quite a few years, like at least five years, I couldn't. So I was always thinking, okay, what else can I do that that would be age appropriate? So uh, and also for my heart too. I don't. I wasn't that doll anymore. Right. So, yeah. I, I was tired of being cute. Mop Man kind of lived in my brain for quite a few years. Different parts of it. I knew the idea of a cleaning lady is timeless. I knew that it needed to be mine. My doll was self-expression. It's vulnerable. My characters seem to be vulnerable, uh, which people sympathize with, and they want to. They they get they feel that, and it, it's the empathy that that you know gets their attention. So not feel sorry, but you know what I'm saying. Is it yeah. like oh yeah, no, that you sort touch of thing. Them. It's real. Yeah, it, yeah, it, and it's real. It's very real. That's so it, I had pieces together, and I think I showed you this. Um, this this booklet that I did, this is yes. my, my lecture notes. Yeah, it says find yourself by connecting the dots. In yes. this case, this is a matter of connecting a lot of dots. So, okay, cleaning lady sounds good to me. Um, I'm not as attractive as I wish I were. If uh, 
I can't go out on stage with this big evening gown and do this kind of an act where I'm like, look how gorgeous I am. That's not in me. And I wasn't that kind of person anyway. Right. So what if I start frumpy? That's okay. People will accept that. Yeah. But then end up looking less frumpy, meaning in an evening gown and taking a bow. And I go, yeah. I could do that because they would accept me looking good. If it was a transformation, yeah. then it would make sense. So mm -hmm. all these deep things were going on. Now, what, what about the, what tools do I use? Well, I have mind tools and magic tools. Okay. That, and music, because music, the use of music guides my movement. Definitely music is always in my head and that's what gets me to move. And then I, um, I had remembered that I'd seen uh, the Rocky movie, the very first Rocky movie where he meets Adrian. Yes. Yes. And yeah. And um, in fact, in my other little book, I have a picture of Rocky and Adrian meeting each other. Mm -hmm. And I look, when I went back to look at pictures, I went, oh my God, I didn't realize it was that close. Right. When I, I got goosebumps when I saw that scene when Adrian takes, she takes off his glasses and he takes off her, her he head. And there's this moment where I, I went, <gasps> yes. <laughs> and uh, so that was that. So all these little things were starting to come together, but I didn't know, you mm -hmm. know. Steve Jobs gave a great speech that he, that's where I got the term connecting the dots about yeah. paying attention to all these little things that happen to you and they might not mean something at the time. Right. Uh, I had also seen a stripper that did that. I don't know if you're familiar with the it, act. It's called the, the Virgin and the Devil or something where she sits down and um, the, her co there's a coat and then the, he takes off her clothes. It's like a stripper act. Okay. Which I thought was fascinating. Right. A lot of it is because being a mind, being a Gemini, whatever reason I want to give it, um, I like the fact that as a mind, I could isolate my body and be two people. Right. So that, that was kind of in place. So anyway, Kenny Raskin in this uh, show did this show, and it was a very touching story. Cool. So a touching story about a, a bum that's really desolate, and this man, a non this man came and, and kind of, you know, gave him some fruit and kind of, so th there was an emotional and a technical and, and between all these things, it went yeah. like that. And then the light bulb goes on. <laughs> yeah. It does. And, and, and that's the, that's the great part. Then comes the horrible part. <laughs> yes. You have to actually do it. Yeah. But I was pretty obsessed with it. Um, yeah. in a good way. Cause I, it had meant so much to me to be able to, it was finally a way that I could communicate so much of what I had inside of me. And, and it's that so, your, your gut instinct, that, that, that intuition that, you know, yeah. this is something that's going to work. You feel it. I, I completely yeah, agree. It, it's, yeah. it's more than that. It's like a draw. It's like this thing that I wish I had more often. You yeah. know, I wish I had those moments more often where you just kind of go completely nuts over something. And I've done it a few times since then yeah. over something like playing the harp or playing the ukulele and, and teaching yoga, all these things grab you like crazy. Yeah. But apparently Mr. Motman is the one that stuck in terms of public recognition. I had the privilege to watch Christopher Hart's magic act in Las Vegas in the early 90s. From that time forward, I was hooked on his magic, his style, and his presence, which were inspiring. And he motivated me to create magic that told a story and to work harder to become a better magician. Chris is an actor and a movie star. He's best known for his film career as Thing in the Addams Family movies and in the magic community for his innovative original acts, his knowledge and lectures, and his passion for his profession. I'm so excited and it's so fortunate that Chris has agreed to talk with us today about Tina Leonard and what she means to him and the magic community. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Can you tell me a little bit about Tina, how you met her and what it's like to work with her? Uh, sure. Uh, Tina Leonard's become a very good friend over the years. And well, th first, thank you for having me on the show. I'm always happy to uh, talk with you. You're a longtime friend that I don't get to see often anymore because you're off in your travels around the world. Uh, but I remember uh, first meeting Tina Leonard. I think it was, I'm going to say, Hollywood Magic Shop. I worked there as a salesman uh, back in the 80s. And I remember her, it's a very vivid memory of her coming in and she was buying um, 
I don't even remember what the name of the trick is, to be honest with you. It's, it, it, it's got a name, I know. I've sold a million of them in this magic shop, but it's a bag, you put stuff in, you shake it, and it becomes a scarf, a lard, so the thing kind of transforms and vanishes. But she was, she was getting one of those, or I was showing her how to fold it or something, and I didn't fully realize at the time, but she was actually working on her uh, washerwoman classic act. And yeah. there's a moment in her act where she's got the, actually she was very great of a hat, that she takes off and it changes to the scarf that she puts on. So she uh, made the connection of that trick, which was used a certain way into making it a costume piece. So that's where I remember first meeting her. Nice. What do you think Tina's done for magic in general? I think that um, we all need uh, role models in our lives. And Tina certainly was a role model for certainly I would say female magicians. Now is sort of the highlight generation of lots of female empowerment now, which is fantastic, it excites me to no end. But I've been around a long time. And so I was around with you and Tina Leonard and Diana Zimmermans, and Lisa Menes, uh, Jade. Uh, there was a lot uh, strong female magicians that I grew up with my day. Nah. So I think all of you uh, inclusively have made the new generation uh, you forged a path that they, they, they existed. I think they serve as a female inspiration, but they also serve as a magic inspiration. I'll tell you a couple of things that I learned watching her act, and I've seen it, I used to watch it constantly every time she was at the Magic Castle, but there's two things I study. I study, when I study an act, I don't necessarily, um, you know, you see Lance Bird and you say, oh, it's the ruffles and the purple and the classical music. No, that's not what you're studying with Lance. You're studying how he connects to the audience. So with Tina Leonard, I study why is this act so impactful? Because if you take the tricks as a whole in, that, in her classic act, they're not very interesting tricks. They're very small. You could barely even say they're stage tricks. And this is being harsh to say this, but in my view, I go, they're tiny. But what she did that was brilliant was she made it into a story. So now these little tricks that on their own would not be interesting, now suddenly make sense within the context of the story. The smallness of the trick, because she's working one-on-one -on -one with a, a character that's come to life that, that is trying to impress her, woo her, um, seduce her. It's multi-levels of story going on. You know, the ugly duckling that tr gets transformed. There's multiple, this story has multiple levels and that's what we're pulled in as an audience. So what I learned is, oh, those tricks I would overlook I go, you find a way to do any trick, that's the path into success, into touching an audience. Um, so that's what I always, and it actually she inspired me for my glove routine in this way. Mm -hmm. I realized, I go, oh, Tina Leonard's having a relationship with somebody on stage without actually having to pay an assistant. And I always stuck in my brain. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, oh, how do I have a female relationship on stage? without having to hire a dancer. And so I thought, oh, a woman's glove, that's the, and then what could a woman's glove do? It could come to life. Oh, I could have a relationship with the glove. So it started sort of in one part with Tina Leonard's, the idea of story and relationship and emotion. Right. That's a fabulous analogy and it's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you very much. That's perfect. <laughs> It was very long. You probably want to stop. No, like no, you nailed it. You nailed it. And it's it's perfect. Yeah. So anyway, Mr. Montman, sweet man that he is. Uh, and he is. Um, so anyway, a lot of, I just started c kind of getting stuff together. I always believe in getting music to get, you know, listening to a lot of music that talks to you and getting all the props, you know, cleaning props, you know, spraying yeah. bottles, brooms, everything, uh, mops, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of evolution and it was a lot of trying to make it not look magic-y, make it look magical instead of, oh, here, um, I didn't, you know, here, here's a magical thing happening to a person that we wish would happen to us. That exactly. was kind of, I think that's what drives it. Collaboration is gold. It's, yes. And I say, put yourself around people that are smarter than you and yes. hope that they'll accept you. <laughs> yes. And I did that. And this magic world, uh, there's so many really brilliant people. I mean, it makes me, it cheers me up to think of all the brilliance there is. And Mike is one of them, of course. And uh, those of you that don't know, it's Mike Caveney, my husband for 41 years. <laughs> yes, yes. Can I just say for the viewers, some of them won't know, if you're in the magic industry, you will definitely know of Mike Caveney. But for people yeah. that 
don't know, he's a fabulous magician. He's a fabulous comedy magician. He's a fabulous MC, um, proven, tried and true. But he also is a publisher. He's a historian. He uh, has an enormous collection of magic, uh, which includes the uh, a portion of the Egyptian Hall Museum. So uh, he, he's the real deal in magic. And that's- Yeah, and it's his, it's been it's it's his, pa it's his passion. It's yeah. his passion. And he's so good at it. And he's such a gift to the magic world, both creatively and historically. And I'm really fortunate that I'm part of it. That I'm, that it's, I'm second, I mean, it's other half, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Come on, you can do it. We need subscribers to obtain more privileges with YouTube. So please, please hit that notifications bell. Spread the word and comment. We love to hear from you.